Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the channel, my friends. Good news. Today, we get to be kids. Why? Because it's Saturday morning React Tunes, and we get to watch some Robotech, specifically episode 13, Blue Wind. <sighs> the show has been awesome. And just to recap why I'm watching this, uh, when I grew up, I had older friends who were able to get up at the six o'clock in the morning hour and watch Robotech whenever uh, it aired in North America, in wherever I lived. And I never had a chance to watch it. I heard from them how much they loved it. And here, these many decades later, I have a chance to also live through the Robotech saga with all of you. And I appreciate your involvement and your support so very much. But my friends, all that is then and this is now. And now if you could do me a favor, hit that like button, smash that subscribe, ring that bell for notifications, and you'll be alerted anytime we go live with Saturday Morning React Tunes or any of our other fare. And of course, if you need, you want, you deserve more Robotech, I'm several episodes ahead over on Patreon. There you can find the full-length format of all of these episodes we'd love to have you link is in the description and of course if you don't like patreon join us here on youtube you get the episodes uh, about a 24 hours early plus a couple other benefits and some bonus content but my friends there's nothing to it but to do it and now it's time to relive our youth and in my case uh, visit the 80s of uh, what could have been as my fr uh, friends we get to watch some robotech episode 13 blue wind prepare to engage maximum warp reaction and away we go <laughs> oh, get ready fanfare so stupid i can't help but it's my ocd kicks in i have to do it now i think about this show quite a bit i really do and i understand a bit of what my buddies meant back in the day when they talked about this show all the time respectfully they never talked about it too much around me you know um and when we played and stuff like that we, had, we all had toys i was ben dixon if i mentioned it before but um you know, being Ben Dixon and being a part of the older kids playing was always so much fun. And that's what was part of the mystery of Robotech for me was that, um, you know, it was just it, it, it means a lot to me. And now it's kind of living up to the hype. And I love that. I really, really love that. Good, good stuff. Great characters. Oh, excuse me. Lisa's my favorite, everybody. It's as surprising to me as it may be to many of you. <laughs> I really, really like Lisa Hayes. Great character. We have not seen many of the other bridge crew for a while. I need some Vanessa. <laughs> Boy, is that beautiful. Wow. Ever think we'll set foot on Earth again? Why don't you ask the commander of the Zentradi fleet that has us surrounded? Go ahead, see if they're out there. Wow, they're out there. Right then, let's hear no more about wanting to go home until the job is done. Understood? Yes, ma'am. Where are all of our... Regular bridge crew, is this like Delta Shift? <laughs> it's cool that they don't have accurate. Oh, here they are. Well, let's watch. Yeah. They've changed clothes. Do these people change uniforms every time they do something? Incredible. <laughs> I love these guys. That means we have disguises. Good thing. Let's go. Oh my God, they're going to put on their clothes? Don't. First off, there's no way any of that shit's fitting these guys. Maybe Rico. Rico's the, the smaller. Oh my, they're... It's a locker room. Have a look. You look fine, Bron. Now let's get started. Bron, uh, yeah. Do you report, Commander Hayes? Do you really think they have that many ships? Hell yes. We saw them. Our computers placed the total at somewhere between four and five million ships. That's ridiculous. But Captain... gentlemen, let's hear the entire What? Four and five million? While they examined us, they continued to refer to something they called protoculture. Now, uh, protoculture's how they evolved, I think. That's my theory. What is this protoculture? It's something which relates to their use of Robotech. I'm not sure, but they think that protoculture is the highest science in the universe and that we somehow possess some of its deepest secrets. Too deep for me. <laughs> Let's get rid of these four assholes. They apparently want to laugh and... Do you really believe this wild tale? This information must be reported to Earth immediately, whether I I'll believe it or not, Colonel right Why don't you talk over global? We've got to break through the enemy barrier. Huh? We can't 
can't make it. At our current speed, we are only two days from Earth, and they must have this information. Uh, it's a terrible idea. They might not be able to hurt the SDF-1, but they can wreck shit on Earth. Yes, Captain? Personally, I am inclined to believe that your report is accurate. <laughs> They're only doing their job. I'd feel the same way if I was in their place. So Ben's just, like, super tall. That's right. Why not look on the bright side? After all, all of us were promoted, weren't we? And we're going home to a big hero's welcome, so why not relax? Well, they were all promoted. Oh, Macross City looks awesome. There's something strange going on, something out of place, but I haven't been able to put my finger on it. Bron, Rico, and who's the third guy? Wow, Why things are slightly out of weird. balance. I always forget. <laughs> That's it, it's a female uniform you're wearing. <laughs> uh, my heart. My shrunken Zentradi heart. Hey, Max, I thought we were supposed to be resting and relaxing. Aw, oh, what's the matter? Don't you want to be a hero? Yeah, huh? pipe down. <laughs> Oh, a hero's welcome. Lieutenant Commander Lisa Hayes, our number one space heroine. Second Lieutenant Rick Hunter. Second Lieutenant. And their intrepid companions, Max Sterling and Ben Dixon. What did they get promoted to? They were corporals, right? Our gratitude is the new singing sensation, Miss Macross herself, Lynn Midmay. Miss Macross? There she is. She's untouchable now, Rick. I think I'd rather be trapped back on that Zentradi ship. Well, it might never happen again, so let's just sit back and enjoy this, huh? That's a good attitude, Max. And congratulations on your safe return. <laughs> you handsome devil. Well, thank you. Minmay. This is the subtle art of leading someone on, I think. Congratulations. Oh. Congratulations. Oh, they all get kisses. Don't panic. I don't think it's a riot. Oh, my head. Oh, no. Uh, how are they going to react to the singing? I, I don't want to say it's not a catchy tune, but we've heard it before, haven't we? I feel incredibly primitive. Oh, oh. But it has a very pleasing effect on the sense. It's mass hypnosis. Yeah, but I kind of like it. <laughs> I want to see these guys get converted to, like, the Micronian way. Where they just, like, effing love. They just love being uh, uh, among the Micronians. It's really unreal. It's really unreal. There's some good lyrics for you. Yay! Huh? Lisa's back, bitches! <laughs> comes back. Nice to see you again. Who are you? Get out of here. Nice to be back. We heard that you received a promotion and you're a real hero. Wow. Yes. <laughs> well, that's string to it. Here you go. Oh, coffee. Coffee's all around, everybody. Coffee's all around. And let me tell you, the Zentradi make lousy coffee. Hey, Lisa, I thought you were supposed to be on a special furlough. Mm -hmm, but I feel most at home right here. That's right. She's... Oh, there they are. She's won the hearts and minds. She is a commander indeed. Well, hey, Roy. We haven't seen you in a hot minute, bud. The radio set for all military personnel to report for duty. You have orders to stay behind you, nitwit. That doesn't apply to you guys. Damn, Roy. I'm glad you understand. Nobody likes a smart aleck. There goes a wonderful guy. Really? Roy's well, always been a bit of a dick, but I mean, I like him. Commander Azonia, the Earth ship has started to increase its velocity. We've never really seen Roy like tear it loose. I want to see that. So we'll just follow and see what happens. Oh yeah, that's right. Who was our Miria? Was it Miria the yeah green hair? Strange, they've matched our speed exactly. It would appear they don't want to risk firing on the ship. That's the Zentradi ace. I want to see her. Vermilion and Ghost Squadrons ready for takeoff, sir. Vermilion? What can we do? We will crush them. Order the squadron to increase speed and attack for the glory of this Entrati and Chiron. Oh, Chiron's going in. That was absolutely against orders. Vermilion and Ghost Squadrons, scramble, scramble. We are under attack. Vermilion That's 
That's not right though, right? Vermillion's Rick's group. And Skull is, that must just be a mistake. They're gonna need Max up there. I mean, Rick's good and Ben's, eh. <laughs> Max is amazing. That's cool. Multi-views. Everyone around here is vanished. What do you think that announcement was? What the heck is this transformation they're talking about? Oh, shit. Oh, oh that's gonna open. Yep. Oh, they're getting the main gun ready. I think it will be advisable for us to try to find a place to take cover as soon as possible before the... Oh, there goes gravity. Oh, that's cool to actually watch it. The great ship transforms itself swiftly and deliberately, section by section, into a powerful defense complex. Very cool. Braces itself for the renegade alien onslaught. Very cool. It's within range of our guns, sir. Transformation complete, Captain. Light them up. Let's light them up. Get the Daedalus attack ready. See, now the Chiron doesn't care about protecting the SDF-1. Ooh, pinpoint got through. Keep firing the main battery. Look at him. It's hopeless, I know it. Lisa, didn't you hear the order? Mm-hmm. This thing wrecks shit, man. Let's hope it does something. He received absolutely no authority to attack the Earth ship. No, Commander. He has received no such permission. Therefore, what are your orders? <laughs> Is that like her Exodor? Both redheaded? He must be stopped immediately. Oh, they're going in after Chiron? The aliens are bringing up reinforcements. We're going to be outnumbered, Captain. You're already outnumbered. As commander of this force, I am ordering you to withdraw to your assigned position and cease the attack, or you'll find yourself facing them body guns. Chiron, back up, bud. She's right, buddy. You're supposed to protect the SDF-1. You're going full bore into it. It's a great shot. I don't understand it. They shielded us from their own attack. I know, but we'll worry about that after we get back on Earth, Claudia. Uh, Earth's not a safe haven. In fact, I'm kind of with the Earth Defense Force that said stay away. Order all hands to secure for landing. Where are you landing? The starboard engines were damaged to re-entry, sir. Ho, ho. Well. This shouldn't cause massive tidal experiences or anything. Are they going under or are they still above water? <laughs> Meanwhile, the nearest coastal countries are experiencing massive tsunami. You're back, everybody. Global's like, I need a smoke. The guys make it, the spies. There we go. It appears as though the brave defenders of the SDF-1 have done the impossible. They have returned to Earth. Yep. Captain Global looks back over the past two years, years filled with memories of combat and strategy. Wow, two years. All right, my friends. We just got done watching Robotech episode 13, Blue Wind. And the only thing we have left to do is talk about it. All right, my friends. Just got done watching Robotech episode 13, Blue Wind. Uh, this one was... Uh, it was good. No, I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm dismissing it or anything like that. I, I like this one. This was definitely a here's how everything stands. It's uh, it's funny that next one's called uh, Global's Report because that's kind of what this was. This was um, we often have this in several of the other shows that we like Lower Decks has it. Um, the Expanse does it a couple times. It's almost like you're taking the pulse of everybody for a second just to kind of like you you finished uh, an arc so like you know the sdf1 returning to earth that portion of the tale is closed so we kind of went around the horn to see where everybody was how everybody was doing what were the events of the day 
which I think is pretty cool. Now, okay, so at the very end, I have a couple questions. At the very end, they were like, yeah, um, in, in referencing the next, you know, Global's report, the next episode, episode 14, they said, you know, uh, two years had passed, you know, it's been two years since blah, blah, blah. I didn't realize it had been that long. I knew that it had been several months because they, they said at one point, you know, two months had gone by and all this stuff. So, but I mean, it makes sense, the accumulation of time and space travel and things like that. So we're dealing with two years. If I, if I'm to understand that correctly, you know, maybe there were, he wasn't including some like earlier time or something like that. But if it's two years, that means that everybody's two years older than what they were when we met. Right. So like, if Minmay, who's the easiest one to pinpoint because of Sweet 16, if Minmay was 16 or 15, is she 17 or 18 now? Is that what's to be believed? If Rick was 19, is he 21 now? Because that makes sense. And I'm really curious to see if they build on that. You know, it, it, I, I don't want to say that, you know, Rick's becoming more mature with age. Uh, I thought, you know, my thing was he was becoming more mature with command having Max and Ben kind of under him is, was a really good for Rick's character. He really started to come around, but if it's a combination of just regular evolution, regular maturation, then that's equally as uh, interesting to me too, because that means we're getting a lot of different dynamics. Again, what a weighty thing to throw for like a youth you know, directed or targeted show because it's like, oh, people get older, you know, and as kids, you never think of that. You never think of somebody getting older, you know, old kids are 17, you know, now you're getting the passage of two years. That's unheard of in a cartoon. You know, the passage of time is really unheard of in a cartoon. Everything is usually like, I, I, I think of mask, you know, mask has adventures and then another adventure and another adventure. There's no passage of time. They don't refer back to their earlier adventures. And that's what we get with the serialized plot of Robotech. You know, we, we get things that build off of one another. And this passage of time is yet another interesting fact that's kind of folded into the, 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 the mystique of Robotech where it's like, yeah, they, they expect you to deal with all kinds of themes, including which is sort of a benign one. You think it's not really that the passage of time. What an interesting thing, you know, again, I think that as a kid, I always, I try to do that. Uh, what would I have thought about this as a kid? I, I know I would have loved it. I know that, you know, I would have been just like my older friends who were so into it, but you know, with the passage of time, that's a real thinker because that's something that kids just by their very definition, haven't had a whole lot of experience with, you know, the passage of two years, two years, two summers, what, you know, that just even seems improbable. You know, it seems almost unbelievable that, that, that two years from when I started watching the show till now, and it's only 13 episodes. So it's not even really like two seasons or, you know, 60 episodes later. And you're like, oh, okay, two years. It's a relatively short period of produced time, you know, as far as these episodes being 20 some minutes, 13 of those, and you got two year window, which makes me think, you know, how are we going to slow down? Is, is everything going to become more concentrated now that we're not traveling? So where we had a two, you know, year time travel from Pluto or the, the dark side of Pluto back to earth, are we going to have like just a, an absolute flood of information coming in here now? Most of this must have been just like unseen between the episodes travel, which is cool. It's perfectly fine with me. I, I would have liked to have had maybe some more touchstones with timestamps, you know, like, oh, it's been six months since Mars. And you'd be like, oh, shit. OK, cool. You know, now I know where we are. But, you know, they did give us one in the two years. This show is just fascinating to me in that it deals with all of these things. And, and, and without too much explanation... Wants the audience, the, the younger audience they're targeting, to deal with it as well. Deal with it, overcome it. This is a story. Accept it. Read it. You know, live it. Uh, love it. You know, and that's what so many of my friends did anyway, is they really kind of were drawn to these more mature themes. You know, they didn't treat us like kids, apparently. They, they wanted us to be audience members, you know, with the full range and bevy and uh, arsenal of, you know, writing tricks or writing tropes and writing conventions at play. Great stuff. Now, specifically, we didn't see much more than, you know, there was a promotion. We're not sure what Ben and Max were promoted to. I, 
I can only think it's a matter of time before Max gets his own flight wing. He has to. I mean, as an ace like that, um, I don't see them taking him out of the cockpit because he's too damn good, but I can see him getting his own group. A lot of really good, interesting stuff. The, the Obviously, the, the, the spies are comic relief, you know, and that's fine. I'm just curious to see where their story goes, where it tracks and what's like, what's the, the idea behind their story is that, see, a group like that is a group that can mend fences between the Zentradi and the Micronians, the humans, because if they're able to say, hey, we're a lot more similar than we are different, um, they could act as ambassadors in a way. They, they're spies right now, but there is an ambassadorial kind of element at play if they, I don't want to say it's it's like a, um, you know, uh, they get assimilated by the culture of the Micronians, but that could happen. They're very interested in all of this stuff. Rightfully so. You know, when you grow up in like a, a military society and then you're given like all of these definitely non-military, you know, shops and neon signs and singing and, and beauty pageants and cities and um, all of these things that aren't military bases or ships or things like that, of course it's going to be intoxicating. It's brand new, you know, and um, it, it's it's pleasing. It's it's something that's not that Spartan or not that kind of very heavy-handed military life. So, of course, they're going to kind of be drawn to it. And Min Mei is developing the way I thought that she would develop as almost like the untouchable other, you know, as somebody you used to know for Rick, you know, I, I had a fling with her and then she got famous and not even a fling, you know, we, we had hint at romance and then she was gone, you know, and she became this huge star and I'm still me, you know, I'm a fighter pilot and everything, but I, I thought that that was a good idea, you know, I, I think it is, it was necessary for her to be like, you know, to kind of flirt with him a little bit, kiss him on the cheek, um, that kind of keeps him spun up in the situation uh, otherwise, you know, Rick might be able to begin to just pull away, realizing that he's no longer in her space, but to have her keep popping up and having to see her and interact with her, that keeps her front and center in Rick's mind and continues to play into what I assume is going to be a love triangle now, a uh, fully formed love triangle now, not just stated between Min May. See, that's the thing. Min May, Lisa, and Rick. Okay, but for a love triangle to exist, there has to be requited love between all three members. At the very least, you know, two members have to love one member. That's the definition of a love triangle. Uh, I mean, Lisa doesn't love Min May. Rick, you could say, loves Min May. Min May doesn't give a shit about Rick, you know, other than having a brother. Lisa may like Rick. Rick may like Lisa. So it's not really a a typical kind of, you know, love triangle, but it's definitely a theme that would require a lot of thought for a younger audience because, you know, there's going to be a Camp Min Mei and a Camp Lisa, and Lisa was established, and it's, you know, the old sourpuss, old sourpuss. Min Mei, young superstar, you know, people are going to be like, oh, I'll take Min Mei, uh, I'll be Team Min Mei because she's more like me. So I'm curious as to see how that develops. It's it's a very interesting show. So this one was really the best thing about this episode were a lot of really cool ass shots. The transformation of the SDF-1, the landing of the SDF-1, uh, you know, the flybys and everything. There was a lot of kind of silence in these moments of descent from orbit, um, you know, kind of breaching the the uh, barricade or the, the um, like breaching the siege, the siege that they had. Uh, that was really interesting. That was, you know, kind of busting through that blockade. That there's a four to five million ships too is what they're, you know, space folded away from. But Lord Almighty, there's no way the SDF one could stand up against that. And technically, all the Zentradi would have to do is say, "Hey, listen, we're going to absolutely destroy Earth, and then we're going to get the SDF one at some point anyway. You know, it'll just be a longer, kind of harder fought battle." On, on your end, because we're just going to work at it until we get the SDF-1 intact, or you can give us the SDF-1, you know, and we'll leave your planet the way it is. That's going to be the play at some point, because I'm, I'm kind of shocked it hasn't been the play yet, but I think it's going to be the play at some point, unless there was kind of a hint, like, maybe there's more to the SDF-1 than what we realize, and that's what they're after. If they can use that somehow, you know, against the powers that be, the Zentradi, 
um, they might actually be be cooking with gas there a little bit. So I'm very curious to see how they develop that, how if the, the mystery of the SDF-1 is solved soon uh, and solved with the answer being something that the humans can use against the Zentradi. That would be very interesting to me. But, you know, again, I think this episode was basically just a check-in on everybody. Let's get everybody's pulse. Let's get the SDF-1 back. Act 1 scene closed. You know, the curtain's down for Act 1. We're going to get ready for Act 2 and see what it now means for the SDF-1 to be back at Earth in a centralized locale and how that the Zentradi Armada, now with conflicting leadership inside of it, um, how they are able to kind of readdress this conflict. I mean, it's two years. At some point, this shit's got to be over. And uh, maybe they've got a new tactic. They just let them in. Maybe there's a new tactic now that they're on Earth. We'll see. We'll see, my friends. But if you could do me a favor, hit that like button, smash that subscribe, ringy ding ding that bell for notifications. You'll be alerted next time we go live with any Saturday morning react tunes, with any of our other sci-fi uh, content, Star Trek, The Expanse, any of that. And of course, if you would like some more Robotech, you just you, you need more. I'm several episodes ahead over on Patreon. There you can find the full-length versions, my friends, and join us anytime for some more duty aboard the SDF-1. But until then, my friends, it's time for us to say goodbye from the SDF-1. Where should we say goodbye from? <sighs> I think we should say goodbye from the locker room. And we are just getting off shift. And as we walk into the locker room, we realize that somebody has taken a crowbar to our lockers and stolen all of our shit. Who is it? Where did my grandmother's dress go? I want answers. <laughs> my friends, until next time we meet, Vulcan Roll, and I'll see you.